Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Edward M. Community, I'm sorry, Edward M. Kennedy Community Health Center for hosting today's session, Stroke Prevention and Management in the Primary Care Setting with Dr. Anarudh Sri Krishnan. Dr. Sri Krishnan is a vascular neurology a vascular neurology fellow at Stanford Hospital in Palo Alto, California, with research interests in quality improvement within acute stroke care, as well as medical education. He completed his MD at Yale School of Medicine with a master's in health science in research and stroke outcomes. He then pursued his neurology training at Harvard Medical School, affiliated with the Mass General Brigham Hospitals in Boston, where he served on Stroke Quality Task Force. He currently has an NIH grant to develop telemedicine technologies to improve outpatient stroke care, and we are very lucky to have him as one of our Maven Project speakers. So Dr. Sri Krishnan, when you're ready, please begin. Yes, uh, thank you so much for having me, and uh, thank you so much for your interest in this topic on uh, stroke care, which is always something I am uh, love talking about and have the opportunity to discuss. Uh, these are my disclosures. I don't have um, anything to disclose. Um, so this is a very broad topic with a lot of things that we can discuss. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, what I'd like to do is start off by talking a little bit about the diagnostic criteria and etiologies of stroke, which help guide our management, um, and then spend a good chunk of time thinking about the high yield workup and diagnostic tests for patients with an ischemic stroke. Um, and then we'll talk uh, a bit about the medication management for primary as well as secondary stroke prevention. Uh, and then uh, we'll end on some common clinical dilemmas in practice with ischemic stroke patients, how to manage those in the outpatient setting. Uh, and then I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have on this topic as well. Throughout this talk, I'll be referencing a number of clinical trials, as well as referencing the class one AHA recommendations. And I will attempt to highlight those with these icons below, just so you understand where uh, the source of this information is coming from. Great. So um, we have to always start off by asking ourselves, what is a stroke? Uh, and so when we discuss a stroke, what we're talking about is a fixed neurological deficit of the central nervous system due to some form of pathological uh, process occurring with blood vessels. Now, what you'll note is that this is a completely clinical diagnosis. And even though we use imaging technology like MRI in order to better um, understand the, uh, a stroke in process, it's not part of the actual diagnosis. Um, MRIs, however, can be helpful when we're attempting to differentiate something like a TIA um, or a mini stroke, as I describe it to patients, versus a stroke. And the MRI is kind of that cutoff we use in order to see if actual ischemic damage has occurred um, on imaging, which would help us define a TIA versus stroke. Previously, before MRI technology, we used it based off how long patients' symptoms arose and if they went away or uh, if they were persistent in time. However, now we use a finer definition with our um, uh, imaging technology. When we think about strokes, we divide them grossly into hemorrhagic and ischemic strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes uh, compose 20% of the overall stroke population, and this is due to a process where the blood vessel ruptures, leaking, and bleeding. There are many causes for hemorrhagic strokes. Um, the most common are hypertension, but we can also see it with amyloid angiopathy, tumor, vascular malformations, et cetera, et cetera. We won't be talking as much about hemorrhagic strokes, which you can de dedicate an entire hour to. Instead, what we'll be talking mainly about are ischemic strokes, which compose the other 80% of the overall stroke population. And an ischemic stroke is um, due to an occlusion of a blood vessel. And that occlusion can be either thrombotic, where we have plaque of the, the blood vessels that rupture and then cut off the um, blood vessel, or embolic, where a clot forms somewhere else in the body and then travels downstream and occludes one of the blood vessels. In the 1990s, uh, the field of uh, vascular neurology developed the TOAST criteria, which was a gross char characterization of the different etiologies of stroke. I'd say that this 
criteria has gotten somewhat outdated because we now know so many different etiologies of stroke. However, it does highlight the three most common etiologies for stroke. So there is still some clinical relevance with this criteria. The three most common etiologies of stroke are small vessel disease, um, large artery or artery to artery um, disease where a clot from one artery travels downstream to another artery. And the third being cardioembolic, a clot forming um, in or around the heart and then traveling upstream into the brain. So to kind of break these etiologies further down and how they might um, guide our management, when we think about deeper strokes that occur um, in the brain, um, these tend to be due to small vessel disease. So this, these are strokes um, that are also known as lacunar strokes or lacoons, and they affect uh, different regions of the brain, like the internal capsule, the thalamus, or the brain stem. And I've included some examples of how these strokes might look like on MRI technology. These are deep strokes within the brain because the smallest blood vessels within the brain get occluded. Um, these can have fairly large ramifications in terms of clinical symptoms, because this is where all the fibers from the cortex come together deep within the brain to exit out through the um, brain stem and into the spinal cord. Now, small vessel disease strokes, because the small vessels they occlude off, we really wanna emphasize the risk factors that can cause these strokes like diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. So when I see a patient in clinic with evidence of a small vessel disease stroke, these are the key factors that I'm going to try to hone in on with the patient, making sure we work very closely with their primary care physician, cardiologist, or endocrinologist in order to ensure that their risk factors are well controlled. In contrast, when we think about cortical strokes, what we're referring to are these large wedge-shaped infarcts that are due to a clot in one of the blood vessels that occludes a complete subsection of the brain. And I've again included some examples of how these cortical strokes can, um, uh, can look like on imaging. When we see strokes like this, most commonly we're more concerned with a clot that travels from uh, somewhere else in the body and then occludes that blood vessel. This can most commonly be seen in patients with atrial fibrillation where a clot forms in the heart and as a cardioembolic stroke, so the clot travels from the heart downstream. Um, but it could also be due to uh, a clot originating from another major artery and then traveling downstream, um, uh, causing this cortical wedge-shaped infarct. So when we see strokes like this, we're going to spend more emphasis in terms of uh, diagnostics and management, making sure that we have good imaging and evaluation of the heart, as well as the neck vessels. So that's a little bit about the different etiologies of stroke and the kind of paradigm we think about. When we think about the evaluation in order to determine the etiology, there's a series of imaging that we standardly start off with when we're thinking about patients with a suspected or a confirmed stroke. Obviously, the most common imaging is brain imaging, and we've talked a little bit about the power of an MRI in the diagnosis um, of a, a stroke. Um, a head CT will be less sensitive in order to diagnose a stroke. However, if we look at a head CT down the line, um, a greater than um, uh, a couple of days out, we can sometimes see a stroke on CT, the head CT, um, but an MRI brain is going to be the most sensitive test to end up diagnosing a stroke. But it's important not just to look at the brain, but to obviously focus on the vessels of the brain, because this is a pathological vessel uh, process of the vessels. Uh, we can divide the vessels into the vessels intracranially or the brain vessels as those extracranially, specifically the neck vessels. When I get referrals for patients with a stroke, uh, I would say the neck vessels are the most common area that um, uh, people forget to think about or look at. And I always kind of um, hone in the trainees that I work with to always remember to look and evaluate the neck vessels in detail. This is especially important when we think about therapies, specifically surgical interventions for the neck vessels, which have shown to reduce mortality and morbidity, um, which is why uh, a good evaluation of the neck vessels is important, um, as well as looking at the intracranial vessels. 
There are many ways that we can look at neck vessels, and I always think it's important to kind of highlight uh, the different modalities that are available to us. So, you know, the most common way to look at the neck vessels is a CTA of the neck, and so this is an iodinized um, contrasted scan. So this is going to be of limited utility in patients with um, uh, severe kidney, chronic kidney disease, or those with contrast allergies. However, this test does give us the best resolution of the vessels themselves, as well as um, give us imaging of any sort of plaque characteristics, which can be helpful in terms of management and evaluation. We have an MRA. Um, uh, this is also gives us uh, evaluation of the neck vessels, and it can be done um, with contrast or with gadolidium in this case, but it could also be done non-contrasted where we're just looking at the time of flight of the, uh, the uh, vessel flow. As you can tell from these images, the non-contrasted um, MRA is of limited utility. It's not um, that good because of pulsation artifact to actually look at the vessels, but it can give you a gross estimate if there's a severe stenosis, however. Obviously, a gadolidium or contrasted MRA of the neck vessels is useful. Of course, um, this is uh, this can't be usually conducted in patients with um, severe kidney um, disease. Uh, so in, in those cases, at least an MRA time of flight or a TOF um, can give you some, some imaging of the neck. But in patients with contrast allergies or kidney disease, we can always do a carotid um, ultrasound, and that will give you fairly good resolution um, of at least the degree of stenosis um, that's exhibited. Um, I also like using carotid Dopplers, especially in the outpatient setting, where I am following patients over time to see how a degree of stenosis may change over time. Potentially, a patient might not be eligible for some surgical intervention, but we want to track those Dopplers over time to see if there's any changes. So having a baseline set of Dopplers can be helpful in that circumstance. So that's a little bit about neck vessels. Apart from neck vessels, we talked about the importance of, um, of evaluation of the heart. And when I think about evaluation of the heart, the two things I think about are evaluating the structure of the heart and then the rhythm of the heart. So obviously with the structure of the heart, our go-to go -to test is an echo. And there's specific things that we're looking on at the echo that can give us insight into a patient's stroke. Um, we think about the uh, ejection fraction because patients with a reduced ejection fraction are more likely to form clots in the heart that could travel to the brain. We're also looking for left atrial dilation, which could be a marker for um, atrial fibrillation and might give us insight that this patient might end up having atrial fibrillation. We look at valvular um, dysfunction or vegetations on the valve, which can also be a source of um, embolus. We look for an actual frank thrombus within the ventricles of the heart. And um, in young patients, we can um, consider uh, the presence of a PFO or a, a, an atrial septal um, aneurysm or some form of connection between the left and right circulation. Um, but those that's exclusively something we think about only in younger patients. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, down the line. That's the heart function and then heart rhythm. We have multiple ways of monitoring patients uh, after a stroke. Uh, these include a Zio patch, which is a patch placed on the chest that can be placed anywhere between seven and 14 days um, to give us heart rhythm monitoring. Uh, mobile cardiac telemetry, which can be placed for slightly longer, up to 30 days. Um, and in patients in which we have high concern for uh, cardioembolism, we can place an implantable loop recorder, um, which is placed subcutaneously, and this can stay up in place for up to three years and give us recordings. When it comes to AHA guidance in terms of heart rhythm evaluation, the current recommendations um, suggest at least 24 hours of monitoring, which is usually done in the inpatient setting if someone's hospitalized for a stroke. Most pr providers will do at minimum two weeks of monitoring. At Stanford, we commonly prescribe patients with a Zio patch at the, after their hospitalization discharge. Um, and what we know in the research is that monitoring patients for longer periods of time results in higher rates of capturing um, atrial fibrillation. And this was based off the studies of, with the implantable loop recorder. Um, just monitoring patients for years on end, we'll see that we're capturing more patients with atrial fibrillation, which may have been missed 
uh, initially. For this reason, in patients that we have a high suspect for uh, cardioembolism, um, we'll usually recommend an implantable loop recorder, even if their initial two weeks of Xyopatch testing was negative. So that, those are the kind of fundamentals in terms of the diagnostics we think of when we're evaluating an initial patient with an ischemic stroke. But then when we think about the management of ischemic stroke, these are the fundamental pillars I think of when I'm managing a patient. Um, the first being, and what you'll notice as we get into this is that um, both stroke prevention and cardiac prevention um, kind of go hand in hand. So what's good for the heart um, tends to be good, what's good for the brain and vice versa, which kind of makes our all our jobs a little easier. Um, and the main pillars of kind of secondary prevention um, are antithrombotic therapy, cholesterol modification, control of hypertension and diabetes, and then obviously educating the patient on important lifestyle changes. So we'll dive into a, a bit of these topics. The first one being antithrombotic therapy. And so it's important to know aspirin 81 milligrams is really the mainstay of secondary stroke prevention. Um, that adage, like if you had a stroke, just start taking an aspirin really gets you far when it comes to secondary prevention. Um, now, before we even get to secondary prevention, we can think about primary prevention. So patients who've never had a history of a stroke um, is there any data or utility with aspirin to prevent stroke? Uh, no, there isn't any kind of research to, to suggest that. So when it comes to primary prevention of stroke, we really look to our co colleagues in cardiology, just thinking about overall cardiovascular benefits. And as you're familiar, the um, uh, US Prevention Service Task Force has now changed the recommendations regarding aspirin for primary prevention of at least cardiovascular disease. Um, so we do not routinely place patients on aspirin uh, for primary prevention. But as I mentioned, if you've had a history of a stroke, um, and that's the patient population that we see, um, aspirin um, 81 milligrams monotherapy is, the, is usually the way to go. And we know that um, initiation of this medication results in a reduction of stroke, MI, and death of approximately 13%. Um, now, a very common clinical dilemma that comes up is uh, the patient that you're seeing in clinic is already on aspirin 81 milligrams, but then has a stroke. What do you do um, with that patient? Do you change the antiplatelet therapy? Do you increase the dosing? Um, there isn't very much, there isn't very good data one way or the other about what the best clinical practice is. Um, this was a kind of survey of neurologists done in 2021 to just survey um, neurologists nationally about what they would do in that circumstance. And you can see the wide variety of different approaches with some um, providers choosing um, to just remain on aspirin monotherapy, others switching to medications like clopidogrel, and then um, a subset of patients um, switching to anticoagulation or dual antiplatelet therapy if there was a particular indication. Um, what I will just point out is that there is fairly strong evidence that higher doses of aspirin will increase your risk of bleeding, but wouldn't necessarily um, increase your risk of a recurrent stroke. For that reason, at least at Stanford, we do not routinely increase the dose of aspirin. That's kind of the big no-no. Most providers here will just keep the patient on aspirin, um, 81 milligrams, and work on other ways of preventing stroke by cholesterol, diabetes management, blood pressure management. Now, dual antiplatelet therapy has been kind of the new thing within the past decade that's come out that has changed the way in which we manage stroke patients Conceptually, to understand why we think about dual antiplatelet therapy, if we consider a patient um, over time uh, and their risk of an event um, after an initial stroke, their risk of a recurrent stroke takes a kind of J-shaped uh, curve where the highest risk um, tends to be early on, usually within uh, early on, uh, and then kind of levels out over time. Uh, and then we know that uh, the initiation of dual antiplatelet therapy results in an increased risk of bleeding. Um, and so what research has been attempting to identify over the past decade is if there's a period of time 
in which the benefits of dual antiplatelet therapy outweigh the bleeding risk, especially when it comes to the risk of a recurrent stroke, which we know the risk is higher earlier on. And so that's kind of where the, um, these studies have come out in the past couple of years. Um, point, uh, well, Chance, that was published in 2013 and with a primarily Chinese population, um, but then Point in 2018, which was the multi, um, multi-country study, including U.S.-based sites, um, which has kind of changed the way we practice. Both of these studies looked at a combination of both aspirin and Plavix in various dose regimens over the course of 90 days with a, uh, a period of time in which dual antiplatelet therapy was emphasized. Um, the key point takeaways from this is that they found that um, 21 days tended to be where the most bang for your buck was found when it came to dual antiplatelet therapy. After that point in time, there wasn't a, a higher risk of bleeding. Um, so since, since these trials were conducted, um, there is now class one evidence for the initiation of dual antiplatelet therapy uh, for uh, patients with a minor stroke. And this is the one caveat of both of these studies. Patients uh, that were enrolled in these studies all had a, a small stroke, um, not a major devastating stroke. That was defined by the uh, stroke grading scale of less than four. Uh, and the reason for that is, is because we know that larger, bigger, major strokes um, have a higher chance of hemorrhagic transformation. And so we're much more hesitant to load on antiplatelet therapy. Most providers will use a regimen of dual antiplatelet therapy um, for about 21 days. That's usually consists of aspirin 81 milligrams plus Plavix 75 milligrams for that 21 day period. And then after that point in time, we'll transition to monotherapy, which in most cases would be aspirin 81 milligrams. Um, since these landmark trials were published, there have been other trials that have looked at combinations of ticagrelor and aspirin instead of Plavix and aspirin um, with uh, very similar results. In fact, there's an ongoing national um, trial looking at which medication is better for this regimen, ticagrelor or Plavix. Uh, and uh, that is still an enrollment. Um, that's a bit on antiplatelet therapy. When we go to um, statin therapy, uh, the recommendations are fairly standard. The studies that came out back in 2006, uh, including Sparkle, are the ones that we still use today. Um, for patients with a history of stroke, we are aggressive with our LDL goal less than 70. Um, and that's you, with a high intensity statin, usually a Torba 40 or 80. Um, and then we usually reevaluate patients every three months or so to make sure that they're at goal. And if they're not at goal, we then um, either up titrate the dosing or add on therapy in order to get their, them to goal. Um, and patients that don't tolerate statins should also be considered for other types of medications. Um, uh, either PCSK9 inhibitors, um, the initiation of Zetia, um, or uh, Bempidoic acid, which recently was published in the New England Journal of Medicine um, as an effective treatment with outcomes data that was uh, useful in patients who were statin intolerant. Uh, for primary prevention, there aren't any strong guidelines for um, overall uh, neurovascular protection. Um, however, it's reasonable to consider an LDL goal less than 100 for this patient population. Um, and then when it comes to blood pressure, there is class one evidence to suggest blood pressures less than 130 over 80 um, as tolerated for uh, recurrent, less than recurrence of stroke. Blood pressure is a major goal of mine. I, I think that, that we kind of undertreat blood pressure, especially in our stroke population. So I'm fairly aggressive about attempting to get patients to goal. And the guideline recommendations don't recommend any medication one over the other. Um, so it's really important to consider the patient's other medical comorbidities when making decisions about this. Again, uh, a, an issue that comes up clinically is, you know, this patient's had a stroke, maybe they've, they have some narrowing in their blood vessels. Shouldn't I be aiming for a higher blood pressure in the setting of uh, severe stenosis or uh, right after the stroke um, because I wanna help with perfusion to the brain? 
Um, so this gets at the concept of um, uh, blood pressure dependence, um, which is the idea that um, there are worsening of neurological symptoms when you lower the blood pressure. This is something that we sometimes do see acutely after a, a stroke occurs within the first um, couple of days of a stroke. And so usually for the first couple of days, we aim for a higher blood pressure. However, long-term, it's important to attempt to uh, aim for our overall goals because we know that patients develop collateral blood vessels, which will allow them to uh, uh, better blood pressure control down the line. So while yes, it's true acutely, we might be a bit more conservative, uh, you do want to attempt to aim for this long-term. And then, you know, it's always important to educate uh, patients and their families about potential lifestyle modifications that can help with overall stroke, but cardiovascular disease. Um, when it comes to diet, you know, there isn't one particular diet that's shown to be effective, but there is some um, moderate evidence that the AHA points to um, suggesting the Mediterranean diet can be helpful. Uh, the diet that uh, promotes a variety of uh, fruits and vegetables, a uh, uh, smaller emphasis on red meats, nuts, substitution of butter with olive oil. Um, and then when it comes to exercise, the, the kind of rule of thumb is 30 minutes, five days a week of moderate intensity exercise. I talk to my patients about either jogging, swimming, using an elliptical, starting a new activity to kind of help their overall um, activity uh, to help with their ben um, overall benefit. And then, you know, I think it's important as stroke neurologists that we're always looking to make sure our patients are well connected, connected to their other providers, like a primary care physician, a cardiologist, or an endocrinologist where applicable so that this is a team-based approach and we can really think about the patient's overall medical um, disease burden and helping reduce that to help them with their uh, 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 health down the line. With that, I'm going to go into a couple common clinical scenarios that can come up. Um, so this is case space to kind of uh, help us with. So the first case is a 65 year old gentleman with multiple cardiovascular risk factors. And he's coming in with um, transient episode of right um, hand weakness. And um, on examination, we look at his uh, left, or we listen to his left parotid with a stethoscope and we hear a brewery on physical exam. And uh, we're concerned about plaque in his carotids. Uh, we get a carotid ultrasound to look at his vessels. And we see that with the carotid ultrasounds, his peak systolic and his end diastolic values are both elevated. Uh, we get a CTA of his neck and we see this big Goomba plaque um, that's sitting in his internal carotid artery um, with a seven, greater than 70% um, stenosis. And, you know, putting this in the clinical context, uh, the left uh, carotid artery and uh, symptoms on the right um, of the, the patient's body, this is would be classified as symptomatic carotid stenosis. Um, and so kind of what to do with that, uh, you know, with carotid stenosis, uh, the question is whether it's appropriate to advocate for surgery or not advocate for surgery. So the, the two main factors when we think about carotid stenosis are one is, are we classifying this as symptomatic or asymptomatic? And that is based off whether the patient is experiencing symptoms that we can attribute to that stenosis. And then the second is uh, the degree of stenosis. Um, is, it, uh, le is it very mild? Is it 50 to 70% or is it greater than 70%? Um, by and far, the easiest situation would be symptomatic stenosis that's greater than 70%. That's where the AHA has very clear guidelines of uh, mortality and um, recurrence benefit for surgical intervention. And then um, after that point, uh, when it comes to asymptomatic um, carotid stenosis, that is where probably the most gray area is. So that is any degree of stenosis, um, but without neurological symptoms. And there are ongoing um, clinical trials in order to better assess the patient population that might benefit from surgery. Uh, when you get to uh, evidence of symptomatic stenosis that's within this 50 to 70%, um, the, the evidence for intervention becomes slightly weaker 
Uh, and that's where I think a vascular neurologist can really be helpful in, or in attempting to understand the patient's overall risk factors and um, really assessing and working with the patient about whether surgery is appropriate for them. What we do know about these interventions, if you're considering intervention, it's very much recommended that you get this intervention within two weeks. If you look at the benefit that's offered to the patient after that two week time period from the initial stroke event, the, 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 end, the benefit that you receive from the surgery drops down dramatically. And again, it goes down to the risk of a recurrent stroke. As we talked about, it's something that's seen early on um, within that initial two weeks and then drops down. So if we're thinking about surgery and preventing stroke, we're really thinking about that initial two weeks after an episode. Um, and then there are two types, two major types. I mean, now there are more surgical procedures, but classically there are two um, surgical procedures that we think about. One is a carotid endarterectomy, which is an open procedure where the vessel's open and the vessel's cleaned out. And the other is stenting. And there are multiple factors that uh, we can consider um, uh, one versus the other. Uh, and I, I think that's really based on the local practice and the physicians in the area, as well as the patient's medical comorbidities. So that's a much more nuanced discussion to decide which approach is best for the patient. Um, moving on to another case. So here we have a 45-year-old female. She also has major risk factors for the development of atherosclerosis. And um, she had an infarct in her left hemisphere. And when we look at the vessels intracranially, what you'll notice is that there's a degree of stenosis or severe narrowing in one of the vessels that is attributable to where her stroke occurred. And so what this is an example of is symptomatic, severe uh, intracranial stenosis. Um, so instead of now the st stenosis being in the neck vessel, we're now thinking about a stenosis in one of the intracranial vessels and what to do about that. So the evidence for surgery in this circumstance um, up until now is, is not considered to be good. So we do not recommend surgical intervention for severe uh, intracranial stenosis. Uh, instead, what we do is maximal medical management um, and maximal medical management in this circumstance is the use of dual antiplatelet therapy like we talked about before, but now extending it out to about 90 days rather than the 21 days that we previously talked about. And then really focusing on the patient's other medical morbidities, diabetes, hypertension, um, advocating for lifestyle changes. Um, and that's what we kind of classify as ma maximal medical management. Now, if patients have recurrent strokes, despite all these interventions, then um, that would be a, a, a case to talk about with an interventionalist about the utility of stenting. But jumping to stenting um, and surgical evaluation is not something that we do uh, in these patients. We attempt to, as much as possible, maximize their medical management. Um, the third case is a 30-year-old female um, she, she's quite young, as you can tell, and she's coming in with a recent stroke. She doesn't have any kind of traditional risk factors we think about for stroke, um, but she's found to have this PFO um, that was discovered on echo and kind of what to do about this. So I, I mentioned I'd get to with this case. Um, there's a lot of nuances when we think about the PFO in terms of um, if it was related to the stroke or not. What I tell patients is about one third of patients out there have this small little hole in the heart. And for most patients, it's completely meaningless. It's incidental. However, in a select group of patients, specifically young patients, when we see this PFO, we, we do think about it as a potential mechanism of a stroke um, because it is a way for a clot in the venous circulation to travel through the hole into the arterial circulation to cause the stroke. There was a score that was developed known as the ROPE score, which I have listed here. Um, that, that can risk stratify patients, um, not only with the probability of them having a PFO if they've had a stroke, but also um, if that PFO is attributable uh, to the etiology of their stroke. And the key points to think about with this risk stratification is the way you get more points is you basically have all the, you don't have any of the traditional stroke risk factors and you're quite young. 
Um, that is kind of what really tips us over into thinking that the PFO is implicated in, in the cause of this stroke. There is a, a surgical procedure for PFO closure, and it can be done in multiple different ways. Um, and the nuances of those trials are, are, are the, the success rate for PFO closure in terms of uh, decreasing risk of recurrence is really seen in the appropriate patient population. So in patients who we really do think the, the stroke was caused by the PFO and patients with high risk features on the PFO. So a large PFO or a PFO uh, associated with um, other high risk features like an atrial septal aneurysm. Um, so this is a bit more of a nuanced discussion, which not only is a neurologist involved in, but the cardiologist that's performing um, the potential PFO closure. Um, it's also important to note patients who have had, had a stroke with uh, where we implicate the PFO, their overall risk of a recurrent stroke is actually quite low. Um, uh, and that's because when we think about the, the risks of a recurrent stroke, um, the risks of hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, those are going to be much stronger risk factors for a recurrent stroke than just the presence of this PFO. Uh, this next case we have here is a 34-year-old uh, in a car accident. Um, so he's had whiplash injury. Um, and then he has this episode of acute dizziness. And so we get uh, imaging and we see that he has um, a dissection of one of his vertebral arteries. Uh, as you can see here, you can see this vertebral artery is nice and thick uh, and connects re really easily into the basilar artery, but this vertebral artery is very thin and flimsy and narrow, um, and there's a concern of a potential dissection. And in the posterior circulation, we see this small stroke that we can attribute to this dissection, which may have caused the patient's dizziness. And so kind of what to do with this when you see a patient with a dissection, how do you treat it? Um, so when we're talking about a dissection, we're talking in a, about a tear in the vessel wall. Um, that's usually, which can commonly occur because of some recent injury. We also try uh, uh, hear stories of patients coming in after a pretty intense chiropractic massage um, that can cause a tear in the vessel wall. And that tear can be a source for embolus formation that can cause these strokes. There have been previous studies um, that have looked, compared um, uh, patients uh, with a dissection uh, in terms of management, anticoagulation versus traditional antiplatelet therapy, uh, and have not found any benefit um, to anticoagulation, which used to be kind of the main st stay for this patient population. Instead, current guidelines recommend just antiplatelet therapy, which is in most cases just aspirin 81 milligrams. And uh, treatment is for at least three months. Um, I commonly treat for at least six months. And then I, I usually re-image these patients within the three to six month time frame, uh, just to make sure that flat, that dissection tear is healing appropriately. It's not uncommon for there to be some scarring, um, so there won't be kind of complete healing, but what I'd like to see is that the dissection is improving um, by that time period. And then I'll, I'll talk to the patient about whether it's uh, useful to continue taking the aspirin versus stopping it if they're young without any other medical history that would indicate them to continue to take it. Um, Case number five, uh, this is a 68-year-old with a recent stroke. Um, she's had some right arm weakness. She has some spasticity, stiffening of that arm. And she's also endorsing a depressed affect after her stroke. It's very common um, patients after a stroke, about a third of patients will exhibit some form of um, depressive symptoms after a stroke. Uh, and uh, it's important that all stroke patients undergo some form of depression screening as part of their workup because it's a uh, such a common um, common symptom. Uh, there have been clinical trials conducted in the past decade looking at the utility of medications like fluoxetine um, to look at not only their improvement on depressive symptoms, but also on motor recovery. There are 
were some very interesting preclinical work suggesting that using fluoxetine can actually help uh, help with motor recovery. Unfortunately, um, larger scale studies in humans haven't found that to be the case. That being said, we do know that patients with active depressive symptoms are going to be less likely to engage in um, uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy, which are very important for, for recovery. And so ident early identification of those symptoms and treatment, whether it's pharmacological or non-pharmacological, is important in order to help them with their overall recovery. So this is always something that we kind of think about um, as our patients are recovering. And then preventing spasticity is very critical for overall recovery. If um, spasticity is present, it can cause contractures and then completely limit um, patient's ability to kind of uh, 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 participate in their recovery. Uh, so it's important for patients who've had uh, a stroke that's resulted in physical impairment to be working with a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, and a, a speech and language pathologist. Um, to kind of make sure that they're optimizing their rehab recovery. Uh, and then if, if patients start to endorse signs of spasticity, using splints for the affected limb um, can be import, uh, important in order to prevent contractures. Um, I teach patients to use a squeezy ball to make sure that their fingers are continuing to be active to prevent contractures in the hand. Uh, if we start to see signs of contractures, a referral to PMNR can be helpful um, to help with the treatment of both contractures as well as spasticities using things like Botox injections um, to keep their limbs nice and loose um, so that they can continue to see overall recovery. A common question that I get from patients is what should I expect with my recovery? How long it, it should take? So I usually draw them out this diagram, which looks at recovery over a course of time and looking at one domain, in this case, motor strength. So motor strength is going to be worse right after the initial stroke, and then is slowly going to creep up over time. Um, this period of uh, uh, improvement over time usually levels off between the three and six month time point for most adult patients. However, there can be some continued recovery after this time point. I tell patients what determines how much recovery they exhibit and how fast the recovery is exhibit. That really differs from patient to patient, but the key factors that I keep in mind are the patient's age. We know that older patients are going to exhibit slower recovery and not as much recovery. And then the size of the stroke as like the two major factors, larger strokes, again, it's going to be slower recovery and not as much recovery as a smaller stroke. Um, case number six is a 70 year old who suffered a stroke uh, about three years ago. Um, and we're still seeing in clinic but he's coming in asking about if there are new therapies to help him with this chronic weakness. And I always like to end on this just to, you know, just because a patient's had a stroke doesn't mean we've given up, given up on them uh, completely. There are still some therapies that are being used to see if patients with a chronic stroke can still exhibit some motor recovery. Uh, the biggest, newest therapy that's been discussed in the literature uh, is VNS therapy. Um, so what this is is an implanted device uh, that uh, stimulates the vagus nerve um, as it travels up to the brain and it's thought, taught, thought to stimulate the motor cortex. And so this device is activated when a patient is engaging with physical therapy and engaging in a physical task, and it, it just stimulates the vagus nerve throughout that task. And it has been shown that at, at least in the training 90-day uh, period when they're using that device, uh, that the VNS group uh, observed improvement uh, in their ability to, uh, this is upper arm um, uh, mobility is what it's been assessed in currently. Um, it was a study of about 108 patients. Um, the the long term uh, long term sustained improvement trials uh, are currently in the process of being published um, and are promising uh, in, in terms of showing a sustained benefit over time. Uh, and this device has been approved. Uh, it, it's not uh, uniformly being done at most academic centers. Uh, we, we, we aren't referring that many patients um, for this therapy just yet. Uh, 
And I think a lot of it, it just comes down to wanting to see that long-term sustained improvement over time before advocating this for our patients. Um, there are other kind of therapies that are kind of on the market that are currently being tested, including things like the hand glove. Um, but uh, again, these are currently under active, uh, active uh, experimentation and treatment, but there are, there are multiple ongoing um, studies looking at this as well as well as looking at stem cell therapy um, for chronic strokes. These are stem cells that are injected directly into the dead tissue to see if it can stimulate growth. Um, you know, I always caution patients that if they're interested in therapies like stem cell therapy, that they really need to be thinking about this at a major academic center that's engaging in a major like clinical trial and to uh, avoid seeking um, stem cell therapies that they might see in the market or in other places uh, because they're not in a controlled setting. Um, so, so you really want to make sure you're working with a major academic center that's conducting a, a, an actual clinical trial with this. And with that, I will um, pause and we have about uh, 10 minutes or so for questions. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Yeah, so we definitely have time for questions. If you have any, please put them into the Q&A box, use the chat box, raise hand features so you can speak directly with Dr. Sri Krishnan. Uh, otherwise, I have to ramble for a couple of minutes. So please ask your questions. Um, but while we do, I have them to come in. I just want to send a few, uh, give a few reminders that to, um, when you close out of this webinar, your CME survey will appear in a tab on your browser. You can complete it then or you can wait until tomorrow when you get an email from Zoom with both the slide deck and that CME survey link. And I know a lot of you share computers, which is great. Um, the only thing is, is that Zoom only recognizes the account that logged in. So if you'd like to get credit for this session, please just send me an email if you are sharing a computer with someone that you attended and I will make sure that you get the emails, slide deck, the CME survey, and that you are an attendee. And I'm still rambling and I don't see any questions. So uh, we'll just take a quick pause. Awkwardly look. There we go. Oh, great topic. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm really excited for a question. Um, thank you. Okay. And um, although Dr. Sri Krishnan is not on our uh, VC platform, if you do have a question uh, regarding this topic or any of our other topics, you can always use the VC platform to submit an e-consult. Uh, question, I have a 50-year-old patient with a recent stroke with residual left-sided weakness. He's a heavy smoker. I have him on aspirin and Plavex, but I am planning on stopping Plavex at the 30-day mark and continuing him on aspirin. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah, I think for, um for when it comes to a pure neurovascular kind of brain um, protection, uh, that's a very appropriate plan. Uh, the role of dual antiplatelet therapy after a stroke is really just for those initial 21 days and then kind of transition to monotherapy. Um, given that your patient is a heavy smoker, I do wonder if they um, have underlying cardiovascular disease and if they do have underlying cardiovascular disease, then there may be um, additional rationale for other forms of antiplatelet therapy for cardiac protection. Um, but that's kind of separate from kind of what we're thinking about here, just kind of stroke protection. I think when it comes to stroke protection, a 21 day, day course of dual antiplatelet therapy and transition to aspirin makes a lot of sense. Wonderful. Um, is there a role, did you, I'm sorry, did you just ask, answer this one? No, no, no. Is there a role for clopidogrel only and not aspirin? Why would you choose this? Yeah. So, uh, um, when it comes to studies that have looked at aspirin, 81 milligrams versus Plavix, 75 milligrams for secondary stroke prevention, um, the it, data has been mixed in terms of, uh, secondary stroke recurrence, um, uh, patients on Plavix, tend to have lower GI bleeding side effects than patients on aspirin. There isn't any medication that necessarily warrants um, a one way or the other. The, the one exception is patient with um, peripheral arterial disease. 
Um, there was a, a study many years ago, I actually forget the, the name of the study that suggested that patients on Plavix um, with peripheral arterial disease uh, did better in um, kind of stroke recurrence uh, than patients on aspirin. Um, but that's like a very small kind of subset of the population. In general, I think of aspirin 81 milligrams and Plavix 75 milligrams as equivalent. Um, and, I, you know, it's usually a discussion I'll have with the patient if they're on Plavix versus on aspirin about just continuing that medication. Uh, the other kind of caveat to the whole is aspirin or Plavix bit better um, in, in, um, in the Bay Area, in California, we have a, a high percentage of patients um, that come from China. And there are some ethnic um, uh, genetic variations uh, in both uh, Chinese as well as South Asian populations uh, that are Plavix resistant. And so for that reason, uh, unless you're doing genotyping on those patients to see if they carry those genes, aspirin tends to be a better medication for the, that patient population. Um, but in general, yeah, I, there, it's usually equivalent with those um, nuances. Thank you. Is there a main mistake you see being made in primary care or is something you wish PCPs would do differently? Um, I, I mean, I, in general, love working with PCPs. I think they're really kind of the bread and butter of making everything happen. Uh, I, you know, when it comes to purely the stroke evaluation, if I, there's one thing that I, I, I see get a lot of referrals from PCPs um, with a stroke and they, they really do a good job of kind of doing all the initial workup. They'll get the echo. They'll maybe send them out with a Zio patch. I think if there's one test that is usually missed, it's looking at the neck vessels. So I would say that's one thing to always keep in mind just in terms of the evaluation. Obviously when I get those patients, I'll do that testing, but it's always great when that testing's already done because that way I'm just conceptualizing it and thinking about where to um, focus on. Um, I think when it comes to management, um, you know, I, I do see sometimes uh, PCPs want to aim for kind of less than 140 over 80, which I know maybe a couple uh, years ago was kind of the mainstay is just aiming less than 140 over 80. But these days we're a bit more aggressive with our blood pressure goals. Um, so that might be another thing. But in, in general, you know, uh, it's usually very good communication. Um, patients who have uncontrolled DM hypertension hypertension, LDL plus smoker, ASCVD score greater than 30, for example, besides obviously getting comorbidities under control, is there any indication for referring to cardiology for evaluation of underlying cardiovascular disease? Uh, uh, you know, that honestly might be a better question for a cardiologist to think about how they think about who should be seen by kind of preventative cardiology versus another. Um, I work very closely with cardiologists and I think about cerebro and cardiovascular disease in general, but uh, I would say if I had a patient like that, I think the two main questions are, is this patient, should this be patient be on an aspirin and a statin? And in your circumstance, it seems almost always, yeah. Um, uh, the, the two tests that, uh, or the one additional test that I see a lot of cardiologists, especially in the preventative cardiology um, field doing more and more for patients like this, um, that may be in more of a gray area about what to do in terms of maybe they have some risk factors, but they don't know if aspirin is beneficial or statin is beneficial, is a CAC score, a CT, um, a cardiac CT score to look at the degree of calcification in uh, their vessels to use that as an estimate about kind of management. Um, so, so that would be that additional test that I, I, I would think about. Um, yeah. Now, um, I work with a population that is poorly educated and underserved. So often come in months after a possible event, what would be your approach here? How urgent is imaging and neuro referral? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's an, such a, such an important thing to think about is that we see a lot of patients who, there isn't much we can do for the acute evaluation, um, but uh, it's really the, the kind of secondary prevention. I think one of your major goals should be educating the patient about the importance of presenting to a hospital acutely if they were to have symptoms again. 
Um, I think that education piece is so critical because that is how we prevent the severe morbidity that's associated with stroke is really educating them as the first sign of symptoms, they call 911 um, and, and what symptoms to look out for. So I teach patients the FACE ac faith FAST acronym. So FACE, ARM, speech, and then T being time, like call 911. So if you have any difficulty in any of those three, um, that comes out acute all of a sudden to call 911. So I think that's the critical component. And then, you know, in terms of uh, the urgency for imaging in the neuro referral, um, uh, it's these things are, I wouldn't say are as urgent if, if kind of the strokes occurred. Uh, I think that secondary prevention management is probably the most urgent. So making sure that they're on an aspirin, on a statin, um, because everything else can be secondary. We'll, we'll get imaging, we'll use that for risk stratification down the line, but just making sure that they're on uh, education, starting to take an aspirin, starting a statin, if that's appropriate, identification of things like diabetes, blood pressure control, those are gonna be what I'd say are more urgent than they need to see a neurologist in the next three days or so. Katie, hopefully that answers your question, but I'm happy to follow up on that. Thank you. Uh, real quick in the chat, uh, thank you so much. This thoroughly covered the information about the PFO risk was very insightful. Is your stroke management different for those who incur a stroke during stroke due to underlying SCD? SCD. Yes. SCD. Uh, I, can I, I can ask for clarification. Can, huh? I can ask for clarification. Oh, sickle yeah, yeah. cell disease. Thanks. Oh, sickle cell disease. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how do we manage patients with sickle cell disease is the question. Yeah, so that's, that's a really good uh, question. Um, so with sickle cell disease, uh, you know, it's, uh, I wouldn't say my management is that much different. We do know that patients with sickle cell disease, if they go into sickle crisis, can have a stroke. And so the most important thing is going to be making sure that their sickle cell disease is under control. So working with a hematologist is going to be important. Um, when I see patients with sickle cell disease, I'll do the traditional workup that we talked about to make sure that there aren't any other risk factors that they may have. But if that is all normal or, or kind of pseudo normal, then, then I, I, I focus on working with their hematologist to making sure their sickle cell disease is under control. So making sure that they're on appropriate um, therapy like hydroxyurea, that they're um, getting um, uh, uh, phoresis if they need it, um, uh, things like that. Um, yeah. Great. It uh, looks like this is the last question, but if you do have questions, please still send them in. Um, what's the goal of blood pressure for stroke patients? Yeah, yeah. So that would be less than 130 over 80 um, would be kind of the goal for the entire patient population. If you look at um, if you look at the entire population, um, we do know that aiming for better blood pressure, so even like normotensive 120 over 80, um, does have benefit even above one aiming for 130 over 80. So in younger, relatively healthy patients without any contraindications, I'll advocate for them to try to aim for 120 over 80. But in general, when we think about guidelines and kind of the overall population, I, I tell patients 130 over 80 is the, the way to go. Great, thank you so much. I don't see any other questions. Oh, there we go. Do you have, uh, do you have patients keep blood pressure, keep a blood pressure diary as the blood, blood BP fluctuates throughout the day? Yeah, yeah. And this kind of gets into the finer nuances of kind of what to focus on with blood pressure management. The, the approach I take when I'm working with a patient is I do have them take a diary and I usually have them focus on taking one measurement um, at one point in the day that they feel routine and comfortable with. Um, usually I say kind of in the morning, um, after you've woken up, you've rested for a minute, uh, take your blood pressure once, keep a diary and keep that uh, in tow. And that's kind of what I use as I focus on and in terms of titrating their medications. And then if we're having issues titrating the medications, or if we're running into kind of other symptoms, like they're having side effects, uh, like orthostatic hypotension, things like that, that's when I'll start to dive more into, okay, why don't we take it three points during the day? Why don't we do morning and evening, things like that? 
the reason I try to keep it simple starting off is because, you know, we're, we're all human. We all have things going on. I want to make it kind of easy and something that both of us as the provider and the patient can just have very clear expectations on. Uh, and I didn't want to, I don't want to introduce too much confusion. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we had a few comments and last Q&A just said, uh, this was so helpful. Thank you. So Dr. Sri Krishnan, thank you so much for spending your hour with us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and just a reminder that the recording will be available within a couple of weeks. So if you want to review, you'll get the slide deck tomorrow, the CME survey. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Sri Krishnan. Of course. Thank you.